Aeronautics. The Advanced Technology Research Aircraft ATRA of German Aerospace, or DLR, performed an ambitious experiment in flight. A vision took wing. DLR's largest research aircraft was testing a bold innovation. Air traffic communications are still analog. They're carried out using technologies dating back to the last century. Controllers in the tower still use voice communication to transmit course and altitude data to pilots. The pilots then enter them into the flight management system. This remains a potential source for errors, even when the greatest of care is taken. The Sandra project's vision is the complete networking of all aeronautical communication systems. It's to be global, digital, reliable and safe. The challenge posed by the test flight was to use the system developed by DLR and its partners in industry and research to transmit data automatically. The researchers were assessing if this was possible in principle. The information sent by the research aircraft was processed on the ground. The data independently found their way through the network, no matter where the aircraft was located at that moment in time. If one connection failed, another was sought automatically. The flight experiment reached its peak as the aircraft transmitted data about weather, air traffic and course. All the information could be digitally communicated at all times and without a hitch. The Sandra project demonstrated successfully that integrated digital aviation communication is possible. Digitally networked flight is clear to take off. Researchers in Göttingen were preparing for a flight that would remain on the ground. 50 test subjects needed to rely on their feelings as the scientists changed light and air quality in the test flight cabin. The researchers were aiming to find out if the human body can be fooled and whether perceived temperatures could be influenced by changes in cabin lighting. If that turned out to be the case, then blue light rather than expensive air conditioning could be used to keep passengers comfortable. Great for those on board and less costly in terms of airline energy bills. The test subjects sat just as they would during a long distance flight. They spent several hours in the Dornier 728, but some fellow travelers were mannequins fitted out with sensors to objectively measure temperature and airflow. How much did color influence human perception of comfort? Did the surroundings seem colder or warmer depending on the light? How pleasant was the colored LED lighting? As the colors changed, passengers rated their comfort levels. DLR went to Toulouse to prove if a new plane was both strong and flexible enough to be licensed to fly in civilian air traffic. It's a test all new aircraft must face. No exceptions were being made for the new A350XWB. DLR and its French partner Onera have been cooperating since 1999 in carrying out ground vibration tests on planes. In only 13 days, the two partners carried out this decisive test on the new aircraft. Stimulators were mounted in 25 places on the prototype, which was hanging in a suspension device. Then the aircraft was vigorously shaken and buffeted about as data were painstakingly gathered. The computer simulation models were carefully checked against the results and optimized. Researchers were discovering how the plane vibrates when responding to outside forces in order to determine how it would later behave in flight. As the aircraft vibrated, hundreds of acceleration sensors recorded even the tiniest of reactions in its structure to register if the vibrations remain muted. Extremely light materials make the aircraft susceptible to vibration. 
As a result, its structure is very sensitive during maneuvers, gusting winds and hard landings. Before the noise level got up to a roar, DLR's ATRA research aircraft was put into a soundproof hangar at Hamburg Airport. Even a jumbo jet can fit in Lufthansa Technologies' noise reduction hangar, which is Europe's largest. A test was taking place during which the noise produced by the engines would not only be audible, but visible as well. The researchers took up position where no other person would ever want to stand, right at the sources of aircraft engine noise, the main rotor and exhaust stream. They wanted to locate where turbulent oscillations in air current speed and density produce noise. They were looking for the exact source of the din that's so bothersome to airport neighbours. Four DLR institutes are working together on this elaborate measurement project. They're pooling their knowledge of aerodynamics, engine technology, aeroelasticity and construction research. Microphones register the amount of noise being caused by the engine. What's special about these measurements is that we're carrying out noise source analysis with optical measurement technology and far field effects. We're applying them together for the first time in a field measurement procedure. We can actually see into the noise producing vibrations. Lufthansa has been cooperating with DLR for years in investigating aircraft noise sources. The results of this work are later used during production of new aircraft or to refit older aircraft to reduce engine noise. Lasers were used to make the invisible visible. As the roar around the aircraft became louder, the scientists looked at the patterns of the air currents. The measurements are an important aid in simulating jet engine noise on a computer and will also help in the development of even quieter jet engines. Dust, dirt and rugged terrain in a lime quarry located in the Harz Mountains near Winterberg provided the scenery for an unusual DLR photo shoot. The quarry was the backdrop for applying optical measurement technology. Ten cameras recorded background subjects that would later become reference points for DLR's research helicopter, the B0105. The helicopter's blade point vortices change the background patterns. The vortices are exactly what we want to visualize with our 10 cameras. They photograph simultaneously and allow us to create a three-dimensional image of the vortices system. Flying in a lime quarry posed a real challenge. The chopper was pushed to the limits of its maneuverability, and for the DLR pilots, the stunt was anything but a piece of cake. We have to work very precisely, because our scientists had set up a camera field. We almost had to hover on a dime and fly maneuvers in the quarry, and do that with obstacles in the background. It's demanding. You really want to watch out not to nick anything with your helicopter. But their efforts allowed researchers to make the vortices near the rotor of a flying helicopter visible for the first time. Changes in the density of the air indicate areas where vortices are generated in flight. The results of the research will prompt the development of helicopter technology and help make the aircraft even more nimble. Opening the door means entering a virtual world. The facilities at DLR's new simulator center in Braunschweig look like large metal tanks fitted with gadgets on the outside. But inside, they can create just about any situation. The view from this cockpit is 240 degrees, just as in a real aircraft. 
the pilots practice acceleration, handling turbulence, takeoffs and landings, as well as more daring maneuvers in existing jets, helicopters and even aircraft of the future. Space. The International Space Station, the ISS, makes it possible to carry out research in gravity-free conditions at altitudes of more than 400 kilometers. In 2014, a German astronaut will head out and take up residence in the research facility in space. I'm someone who likes to work with his hands, carrying out real hands-on scientific experiments, like here in the Columbus Laboratory with a glove box. That's always very interesting. Or learning something new. Those things are most fun for me. Or underwater training. When you spend seven hours working under very realistic conditions in a real space suit, then you get a feeling for what's coming your way. Those were the highlights that I enjoyed most. Naturally, there were other things that were really hard, like learning Russian in three months. That wasn't so easy for me. I had to put a lot of effort into it, spending evenings doing homework, and then the next day more instruction. There were three months of that. That wasn't easy. A spacewalk is planned for my mission in a Russian spacesuit, the Orland spacesuit. That's a great opportunity to get a look at the space station from outside. Seeing the Earth through nothing more than a piece of acrylic plastic is a much more intense experience than seeing it through the rocket's window. Most of my colleagues say that weightlessness is a great thing that you get used to very quickly, maybe too quickly, unfortunately, because of course it leads you to be a bit lazy. You don't have to move your muscles, your skeleton is no longer bearing much of a load. You have to spend two hours a day exercising so you don't lose muscles and bone, but otherwise it's really pleasant. I felt what it was like during parabolic flights, and I thought it was great. But after half a year, it'll be difficult to accept when the Earth is pulling you towards it with the force of 1G. In Moscow, a unique community of organisms was being made ready for a voyage in space. Algae, fish larvae, crabs and snails spent 30 days in space in the Omega Hab container. They worked in harmony and symbiosis with each other. They were also fully independent of the surrounding environment. Each organism in the miniature ecosystem was to serve the other's needs. Algae and plants provided oxygen, while the animal residents created carbon dioxide. Their waste products were used as fertilizer. Bio-regeneration fascinates me. If we succeed, if we perfect a maximally functioning system on a bioregenerative basis, then we can save a great deal of mass and, of course, launch weight as well. The researchers wanted to discover how the residents would react to a weightless environment that was exposed to space radiation. Would the ecosystem survive the harsh conditions? The flying habitat was supposed to provide insights into biological systems on Earth and might later find use in missions to Antarctica or on long journeys in space. The mission of the Bion M1 in April showed that algae are experts when it comes to survival. The mobile asteroid surface scout mascot is scheduled to take off in 2014 aboard the Japanese space probe Hayabusa. But before the launch, the Scout and its hopping mechanism had to be tested at a drop tower in Bremen to prove glitch-free operation. The craft was weightless for a few seconds. Then the engineers knew that Mascot would be fine in space. The countdown to the inauguration of a new building. It was launch time at DLR in Lampoldshausen. 
school children sent up a rocket carrying the key to open the doors. Exhibitions, films, and unique original items representing half a century of spaceflight history are housed in the Glass Forum building. Now, for visitors and guests alike, aerospace propulsion research is close enough to touch. A 3,500 square meter facility consisting of eight modules is available for research. Humans are the focus at the EnviHab facility in Cologne. Bones, muscles, the immune system, and last but not least, the human psyche are investigated here. At the heart of the EnviHab is a centrifuge and ultrasound facilities that provide unparalleled training opportunities. The ISAT satellite is ready to gather data on shipping. Seen here during testing in Bremen, it will monitor signals from boats. Starting in 2014, the craft's four-meter-long collapsible helical antenna will allow it to monitor the routes taken by ships in the North Sea and Mediterranean. It will be used to coordinate shipping and to locate vessels in distress. Energy. In the future, wind turbines will be larger and more efficient than current models, and they'll be quieter as well. But making a turbine is a challenge in terms of design and materials. One solution is to make rotor blades of carbon fiber reinforced synthetic that's extremely light yet solid and durable. At a facility in Stade, DLR scientists are working on a prototype 45 meters long to determine how the material can be processed optimally for wind turbine use. Pressure and high temperatures harden the components. An enormous DLR research autoclave, the world's largest, is used like a huge pressure cooker, applying aviation technology to save time and money in manufacturing. After hardening of the carbon fiber reinforced material, the components must be placed precisely layer by layer to make a rotor blade. A team of eight robots steps in for the researchers to do the painstaking and often imprecise work of human hands. A special device has been developed for the rotor blades that can carry out this work 10 times more quickly than other processes to date. Materials, solar energy and technical thermodynamics research can all take place under one roof at the new Serastore Competence Center at DLR in Cologne. Here scientists are working together to find solutions for supplying sustainable energy. The modern laboratory building features more than 1,000 square meters of floor space packed with technical equipment to test processes and materials on a large scale. Research is interdisciplinary Solar energy experts contribute their knowledge about solar processes. The materials researchers develop materials that can handle the harshest of conditions. And technical thermodynamics provides insight into effective ways of storing energy. Thermochemical heat storage is a very young area of research. They started on a milligram scale. Then there were reactors the size of a coffee cup. For the first time, this facility allows research on heat storage units to temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees Celsius and weighing up to 25 kilograms. The lines of investigation are diverse. One is, how can synthetic fuels be used to provide and store warmth at low temperatures? Another, how must ceramic materials be made to ensure they're extremely durable and long-lived while providing a high degree of efficiency in combustion chambers, for example? And all that is taking place in conditions as close to industrial use as possible. New concepts are continually being tested for feasibility. The range of activities is wide from materials development to functioning solar power plants to more efficient gas turbines, and from research to industry prototypes. 
Interdisciplinary work shortens the route from idea to market. A combustion component, a linear generator and a gas spring are all parts of a new drivetrain concept developed by DLR researchers in Stuttgart to give electric cars a bit more freedom. If the car's battery is empty, an internal combustion engine steps in that can be powered by a range of fuels. Researchers here have, for the first time in the world, operated this kind of multiple energy car with the aim of giving electromobility a greater share in daily routine. Transport. What if there were a way to avoid the stress of parking a car, searching for a spot and maneuvering? Fast Car One can do it. Along with high performance computing hardware, sensors, special propulsion technology, and a normal smartphone as a remote for the car. DLR scientists working on the major project AIM have made automated parking starting with finding a spot, a reality. The researchers tested the new technology in a parking area belonging to Deutsche Bahn, German Rail, in Braunschweig. The test vehicle negotiated between cars, light poles and construction sites. Radio assigns the vehicle a space through linkage with a parking place management system. And that's where the car goes, safely, reliably and on its own. Later, the car's owner can call it back. It's research that will make guesswork when searching for a parking place old hat. And with automated valet parking, poorly positioned vehicles that take up two spaces will also become part of the past. But there is one problem that won't go away. There still has to be that available space. A model of a vintage car is subjected to headwinds. In Göttingen's wind tunnels, something so old-fashioned is a rare sight. Usually it's aircraft components, locomotive cowlings or rocket nose cones that are being tested for use in the future. But this time, vintage models were used to turn back the clock to the 1920s and 30s. That's when streamlining became a feature of automobiles. Their graceful, rounded lines gave them a futuristic look. Back then, it was the AVA in Göttingen, a predecessor of DLR, that set to work investigating their aerodynamics. Now, a more recent model is in the wind tunnel. Smoke and colored light in the modern facility show that air currents hug the vintage car's bodies like second skins. No vortices form around the streamlined models. Their wind resistance is so minimal that it's even lower than many of today's cars. DLR in Cologne welcomed tens of thousands of guests to German Aerospace Day in September. Scientists and engineers showed how their work was done with research aircraft, in the lab and in workshops. It was science to grasp and marvel at. Diverse, exciting exhibits made the work understandable for everyone and, above all, inspiring for young researchers of the future. <laughs> Baking to break a world record. Ingredients are important, but getting the adhesive technique just right is what really counts. 
A tractor-trailer cab weighing 16 tons was ready to be suspended for one hour, one meter above the ground, held in place by glue bonding two metal cylinders together. On German Aerospace Day, materials researchers at DLR showed they could make things stick. They elevated adhesion to a real art and made bonds capable of bearing record-breaking weights. Security. Shipping traffic on the world's oceans and in ports has been increasing steadily for years. The ships and their cargo capacities continue to take on new, larger dimensions. Space is becoming scarce in areas with heavy marine traffic, such as in the Baltic. The danger of collisions is growing. Almost every other shipping accident is caused by either insufficient or inaccurate navigation data. Precise and reliable information is becoming more and more vital. Scientists at DLR working on the Maritime Traffic Technology Project at the port of Rostock tested new equipment and concepts for determining position, navigation and time data. The test vessel was the Baltic Diver, a rescue boat. A position navigation time system is designed to gather and evaluate the accuracy of navigation data. Correct determination of speed, course and ship position is the only way to reduce the risk of accidents. The new system also provides ships pilots on the bridge and shipping traffic control with reliable data. What is the exact position of one's own ship? Can grounding be ruled out? Where are other ships? Captains need to be certain of these things. Unlike existing systems, this one will include integrity information, so information about the reliability of the signals. They're transmitted to the user and make it possible to discard some satellite signals, those that are disrupted in some way. And in that way, avoid misinterpretation and erroneous decisions. Rapid delivery of information during disasters is key to survival, not just to responders and rescuers at the scene, but for the population as well. At Oberpfaffenhofen, Alert for All is the name of the warning system that DLR researchers have developed in cooperation with 11 international partners. Life-saving bulletins are transmitted automatically on satellite navigation devices, cell phones, LED displays in public buildings, other illuminated signs, and even on television screens at home.